the time has come for the lioness to tell her own story. <laughs> um, so for I and I, you know, it's really important that um, the Rastafari woman's leadership be acknowledged, uh, be utilized mm -hmm. by I and I, by the nation. So I don't see it as um, the Rastafari man leading mm -hmm. the family mm -hmm. as a solo effort. Mm -hmm. I see it more as a joint effort. Um, because clearly we all have different skill sets mm -hmm. and I think we ought to be intelligent and savvy enough to learn from each other. All right. Decision to make, man and woman, mm -hmm. disagree whose decision is going to lead that decision. You want to get um, some idle string bean. I want to get some uh, veggie peas or something like that. We only can make one decision, disagree. Who is a tiebreaker? How do we come to that for that? Probably the woman. Because <laughs> she probably is going to look at it from a nutritional standpoint and say, you know, we need more of this in our living versus that. The brethren might say, what's cheaper? <laughs> she might say, but, you know, it's organic, mm -hmm. but we, I and I need this, you know. No, I'm, yeah. I'm just jesting because yeah. I know you that was yes. in jest. Yes. But, um, you know, there, there are times when I think we all must truth and right stand. Yes. That's it. Truth and right stand, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think if you know your partner, mm -hmm. um, you know if your partner is just attempting to exert a certain type of force or dominance yes. or if what the person is saying is really sound. Mm -hmm. And if it's sound, then that's it. You understand that there has to be a level of compromise between the Rastafari, Rastafari man and Rastafari yes. woman. Um. Well, lion voice, tell them that's the people first choice. Lion voice, make the lion as them feel nice. Lion voice, be the lion cubs we sacrifice. Lion voice, got to show the people them the lion. Well, lion voice. Yeah, and it's last said the first of the Almighty. Well, there are set thrones of judgment to judgment, thrones of the house of the great King David. I and I shall pray for the peace of Ethiopia and Africa. Yeah, well, every night, argument, morning, gone. Sorry about how hard you went No make your heart get hard like some sweat cement Black woman, got to exercise patience Every night, argument, morning come Sorry about how hard you went No make your heart get hard like some sweat cement Black man, got to exercise patience Got to change the frequency Seems like we disagree frequently Mama shopping spree interfere with school fee Daddy they a dance of philosophy Hennessy Every night them fight mostly over money Who gonna stand up fight for the family? Highly Selassie, might of the Trinity Crown with its queen with a baby in her belly still Every night another argument Morning come, sorry about how hard you went Now make your heart get hard like some sweat cement Black woman, got to exercise patience Every night another argument Morning come, sorry about how hard you went Now make your heart get hard like some sweat cement Black man Exercise Greetings in that divine name of his imperial majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I. Glory and honor in the name of his chosen queen, Empress Waziro Menin. My name is Kwasi Bansu, aka the Chasmach Kwasi, aka Ras Kwasi, aka the Reading Ras, aka the Pan African Happy Man. I'm an entertainment attorney, I'm an author, I'm an artist. I'm an actionist, and right now, I'm the host of The Lion's Voice. Welcome to The Lion Voice Network, uh, and welcome to Lion Talk and Lioness Talk, because today is an extra special episode. I've been waiting for this one, uh, looking forward for this one, um, because right now, I have a very powerful sistering 
matriarch within Rastafari Liberty. She's trading forward out of I and I own house of the Naya Bingi. So it's even extra special. Who am I talking about? The item I ask. This uh, queen, she's a mother. She's the founder and executive of the Lalabella Institute. She's the co-founder of the Haile Selassie Learning Center in South Florida. She's former executive director. If I start list out the academic achievements, we're here till tomorrow morning, Bridget and Sistrin. But she's a doctor. She's the dean of a university here in South Florida. She's a mother. She's a Sistrin. She's also the founder and the person who coined the term blue fire energy. What is blue fire? Some say it's the hottest flame. We're going to find out today. We're going to get to that reason. It's very nice, just me. And she's also the one who has put together uh, Empress Men in I Treat or Sip Saba, where the sister and them come together, they build. Um, I, I showed some hydrates of it on our episode with I and I sister in uh, Mama Thea, the chemical engineer, you can go forward. So we've already seen many sister who are connecting with this sister, but now we're going to the root of the blue fire. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to Lion Talk, Rasses Jazanai Kush. Safari. Yes, I greetings and blessed love to Jazz Match Kwasi. It's an honor. It is, it is an honor. And I would say uh, the first time I met the eye, I didn't even realize I was meeting the eye because I met the eye with Ras Culture mm. way back in the days. Right. We brought I around to the different Virgin and Sister in, in South Florida. And we're going to have Ras Culture on here. He's a Virgin, mm -hmm. but um, that was. Uh, I don't even remember. That was many eons ago. Many <laughs> eons ago, could be a decade, two decades. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I, I started to hear about the eye, you know, from Sistrin, um, and then of course the Emperor blessed I and I with um, Mama Walete, and that is when I really became aware more of the eye works because she speaks so highly of the eye. So I just want the eye to introduce the eye self. Where were you born? Um, just give us some context before we get into the reasoning. Yes, I. Well, I'm a native of Miami, Florida. Okay. Um, I know a lot of ones pass through mm -hmm. and are transplanted, mm -hmm. but I was born and bred okay. in Miami. Um, my parents are of African American heritage, okay. so my roots are from the states. Um, I came into the Liberty about six when I was sixteen. Mm -hmm. I'm 52 now, okay. so that's been a while. Proudly saying the age. Oh, yeah. So I want to sister them because sometimes you you know get into the age, you get touchy, but you probably... Yes, oh, no, right. I declare it. You know, I give thanks <laughs> give for thanks, it. Give thanks, give And um, I'm an educator. Yes. Uh, my, my primary area is education. Mm -hmm. um, middle school, high school, the university. Um, now, though, at this stage of my life, I like to proclaim that I'm a philosopher. Okay. Um, my first degree is in philosophy, okay. and I find that now with my work in Rastafari, it has become quite philosophical, okay. especially like you mentioned, coining blue fire, yes. which is not only philosophical, but also metaphysical. Okay. Um, the founder, like the I said, of I, the Haile Selassie First Learning Center in yes. Miami, which was one of the first institutions of its kind. Yes. Um, I realized that there was a dearth of um, institutions, primarily for Rastafari youth, and wanted to be able to provide that. Um, that's been established for about 20 years now. Beautiful. We're going to talk yes. about institutions, and that's one of I and I passion. So Good. we definitely will touch on that. And so Lalabella Institute is the sister organization mm -hmm of the Haile Selassie First Learning Center. Mm -hmm. Again, another organization that was set out for educating. Mm -hmm. However, the focus has changed primarily from that of educating youth to educating the first educators. Okay. And that is the woman, the Rastafari woman. Beautiful. So that's happening. Um, so you have no Caribbean background. No. 
And this is very important because I want to establish Rastafari is not just from the Caribbean. Uh, how do you feel about this term FDA, ADOS? Are you familiar with those terms? No, I'm not. So ADOS is uh, um, African, uh, no, American descendants of slaves mm. and FDA is foundation of black Americans. Mm. But there's a movement in America where, you know, people, um, Africans born in America are saying we were here before slavery. Mm. Um, you know, they're claiming their reparation. They feel like people who have immigrated here kind of take the shine from African American. But since you don't know before for too deep, right. but just to bring your awareness so it's something that mm -hmm. I've I, heard of it. Yes. I didn't know the acronym that yes. went along with the ideology yes. that you're yes. talking about. Um but just briefly to get my input yes. on that. I think that um it's important that we as African people mm -hmm. keep our focus on the continent. Nice. Um there's no sense in struggling yes. for America. Mm -hmm. You know, she's gone down. It's a wrap. Okay. You know, so I've, I've, you know, I hear one's reason about it, but I'm not on that bandwagon. Give thanks, give thanks. I just wanted to be clear because, uh, it's in, like I said, I think Rastafari has not fully hit the youth of America. Mm -hmm. I've said this for my, I've come in the chart that the day that it really take root here, it's, it's sealed up, you know, for Babylon right. because African American culture is the most influential culture on the planet mm -hmm. you know that's without and i say that as a jamaican born right you know i say we run second place you know i mean in terms of the cultural impact globally right. Right. but i don't think we can take away from that impact so with this movement rising up you know i haven't heard about it in rastafari but i know that rastafari from this country mm -hmm. have a role in making sure that the youth of this country are really getting that message like you say unfiltered repatriation so uh, what was it like growing up in South Florida? Give us some context, you know, um, before you became Rastafari, what was your life like? And then take us into the first time you became aware mm -hmm. of the emperor, mm -hmm. Ethiopia, and just that journey. Well, I was raised by my grandparents, okay. um, middle class family. Okay. Um, I had a very wonderful childhood. Okay. You know, I, I don't know, I think around the age of 16 is when I began my major identity formation okay. and began to really ask myself questions regarding what was womanhood okay. and what type of woman I wanted to emulate or I wanted to become. And so, um, you know, a lot of the things that I considered superficial, mm -hmm. I began to kind of discredit them or discard them. You know, I realized I no longer wanted to wear makeup. Okay. I no longer wanted to perm my hair. Mm -hmm. I always laugh and tell people that I was one of those women, you know, when you get a perm, you really shouldn't get a perm any less than a month. So okay. you get a perm once a month. Okay. So I was one of those sisters that I didn't even let a knot or a nap form. Okay. So I always said I like my hair fried, dyed, and laid to the side. Okay. You know, it's always okay. really... this, was, this was up to 15, 16. Right, exactly. Okay. And so, and that was, you know, primarily because of the input of my family. Yes. You know, that yes. type of beauty standard yes. was pushed. And there just came a time I remember just seeing, I didn't see the Rastafari woman first. Okay. I remember seeing a Rasta man okay. and just looking and saying, wow, you know, that's different. You know, look at his locks, you know, look at his hair. And I decided, you know, what if, just what if I abandon, you know, my standards of beauty, which are based on my mm -hmm. family standards and just let me be me, mm -hmm. you know? And I remember looking in the mirror for the first time with no lipstick mm -hmm. and just, not even being able to handle that, you know, because I like really like red, red okay, lipstick. Okay. And I remember just saying to myself, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to do this. I remember not, you know, having the perm mm -hmm. and my mother being almost horrified. Okay. Like she brought me like maybe 20 head wraps and wow. said, if you're going to do this dreadlocks thing, please at least wear your head coat, okay, wow. you know? So I remember going through that metamorphosis mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just at some point just saying, you know what, I'm comfortable with who I am. And it was just so liberating, 
give us a, a context. What was the date? Eighties, uh, seventies? When? When are we talking about? Yeah, about nineteen eighty-six. Okay. Yeah, okay. about nineteen eighty. And I remember all of my friends. I was the only roster person, mm -hmm. not male or female, just person, right? Um, at my high school. Okay. And I remember my friends thinking that I had lost it. I lost friends. People were like on with her you know she's going through some type of crisis and but it was worth it because mm. um i began to do a lot of introspection mm -hmm. as a result of that isolation because. and so I, I i know myself mm -hmm. as a result of that so in terms of um this what was that catalyst that made you say i'm not just going to be conscious but was it seeing that rastafari man image that just Flip the switch that made you well it was that's what struck my curiosity okay. and then being an avid reader okay. um i remember someone bringing me a book um on bob molly's okay. life one of his autobiographies yes. and i remember reading it and going wow so this is really interesting so i also traveled to jamaica for the first time by okay. myself at 16. wow yeah, which was really, every time I think about that, my mother was very free-spirited, and um, I just can't believe I, she allowed me to do that. <laughs> I went yeah. to Reggae Sun Splash. Oh, wow. Um, it just, you didn't know anyone? I Well, you know how it is when mm. someone has a room that they rent, so a yeah. friend of my mother okay. had a room, but okay. I, didn't, I didn't know the person. Okay. Nonetheless, I went, I had my experience, and I remember that this is kind of funny. You know, when you come into Rastafari, there are things that you slowly yeah. let go. Yeah. I don't think I had let go <laughs> flesh yet, yeah. but I said I was Rasta, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. So I remember yeah. knowing that I should not be eating meat, but when I went to Jamaica, I said, I can't fake the funk. <laughs> These people expect a Rasta person not to eat flesh. Yeah, yeah. So I stopped eating meat in Jamaica. Oh, and I remember coming back home and being afraid to tell my mother because the locks was one thing, yeah. but we were foodies okay, together. Okay. And so she would always offer me foods that were my favorite. And then slowly but surely she said, really? Mm. So now you're not eating meat, wow. you know? So yeah, just different things were a catalyst. Uh, did you grow up in a two parent home or was just you and your mother? Or your I was raised by my grandparents. grandparents. Grandfather, grandmother, in the mm -hmm. home. and my mother was very active. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, in terms of, did that start causing a rift? Because this is a story that a lot of Rastafari face. You embrace yeah. the child, and then that separate. Either your parents are trying to convert you back, right? They kick you out. You know, what was your? Yeah, I mean, like? being an only child and being a girl, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't going to get kicked out. Yeah. Um, and there really wasn't a rift. I think mm. because I am an African born in America, yeah. there was more confusion. Yes. They were really baffled. Why are you taking these people culture exactly. over your own culture? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, after a while, I can say that everybody came around because what choices they have, yeah, really, yeah, honestly, yeah. you know? And, and you're so diligent. I could imagine that that seed was there even then yeah. in terms of how you execute your works. Mm -hmm. What was the first time you became aware of the emperor? You talked about Bob Marley, mm -hmm. Bill Bob Marley. But when was the first time you you know, you know, became aware of this uh, King of Kings? Through literature, okay. you know, through reading and um, but being aware of Haile Selassie and mm -hmm. knowing Haile Selassie yes. are two different things, as yes, you know. Yes. Um, I would say the time that I really became aware of, a be, know, knew who His Majesty is, mm -hmm. and I don't say was, mm -hmm. present tense, yes. who His Majesty is, yes. um, was through vision. Okay. Through His Majesty coming and speaking to me mm -hmm. directly. Okay. And, you know, letting me know, you know, if you're on this journey, the doors are open for you. And I mean that all you have to do is call on my name. Wow. Oh, for so um what was the first book you read in terms of um because you're an academic so we're going to get into some book titles because mm -hmm. i want the audience grab them pen and paper mm -hmm. we're going to go through this is the reading rass you know so once i have an intellectual um superhero you could have call her we want to get to you know some of the, the literature what were some of the, the early books that you read about the emperor um about the emperor hmm well, of course, it's autobiography. Yes, crucial. Right. Um, 
goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> you stumped me reading, Ross. You did. <laughs> I know all of them. Um, I just can't. Yes, yes, yes. And think, it's okay if they come yeah, up. Yeah. The autobiography is powerful, and mm-hmm. I could imagine the selected speeches. The formative years yes. of, of Haile Selassie. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say the Lion of Judah had prevailed. Yes, that's a key one. These, yeah. are, these are seminal books mm-hmm. in the chart that you, mm-hmm. you go through. Right. I, I read a lot of books that mm. dealt with Rastafari in general. The culture itself. Right, the culture. So like Barry Chevon's book. And, and Dread yeah, by Dread. the Roman Catholic priest. Yes. Um, Rastafari, A Way of Life. But you know what books mm-hmm. really inspired me the most? Which ones? The Itations of Rastafari, The Itations of Rastafari. Yes. You remember those little books? Yes. There were like three of them. And they had pictures yes. and very visual. Oh yes. my goodness. Yes. I mean, you I had no idea what Hill's life was. Yes, yes. And even though I'm a city woman, right? I would just look at those books and see those beautiful pictures of Rastafari, people living in the hills and say, just something within me felt like, yes, Connection. you know, that's the way to be. Um also the the film um rastafari voices you remember okay, that yes, one yes, yes. i remember there was an elder female on there um and she took down her lock and she said babylon can never catch me all without my wires and she had a phrase she talked about ideological iris <laughs> <laughs> you know what i said wow ideological iris that traverse the world yes, and yes. you know so really some really deep right. things that mm-hmm. touched me you know um powerful and then you were um when you fully embraced the child what how old were you and what year are we talking about i was i was 16 okay. so um yeah so about 86 yeah, 86, I believe. No, 87, because I, I graduated um, high school a year early. So, so what's different about then and now? Because you don't hear about 16-year-olds mm-hmm. embracing the child. I mean, I was at Howard University when I embraced the child. But even that, you know, really see that. And this is one of my concerns, even what motivated the Lion Voice Network to get more active, because I'm not seeing... What has changed, you think, from that time to this time? And we're going to continue with the chronological journey. Don't worry yourself. But I want to just, you know, there's so much. What do you think has changed in terms of that time to this time? Well, I think during that time, um, Rastafari was a bit more prevalent, you know, in certain communities. Yes. Um, the beauty of Rastafari was still rare. The beauty of Lot yes. was still rare. You know, so when you saw a Rasta person, it really did pique your interest. Now you see a person with locks, there's nothing to ask them. You yes. know, when you saw a person with locks in those days, you wanted, well, why is your hair like that? Yes, you yes. know, um, are you from Jamaica? You know, all the standard questions. Now, Everyone and their mother has locks. So the curiosity has somewhat dulled, yes. I think. Um, but that's also a question that I'm concerned with as well because um, there's this lack of a continuum. Yes. You know, as far as women my age, even reaching sisters who are in their 30s. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know what a 30-year-old Rastafari woman thinks. <laughs> you know, I, I yes. don't. I don't know what an 18 year old Rastafari woman thinks, you know, and so it's ironic that on July 1st at Lalabella Institute, I'm hosting an intergenerational Rastafari woman's brunch for um, Tishan in Miami. Just come through, you know, it's free. Eat, let's sip and let's have Jerusalem school room. I I need to get into your heaven. Yes, yes, yes. It's uh, it's crucial. Um, My channel is not all Rastafari people. Mm -hmm. So I want to make it relatable. The 1980s, this is the era of Uncle Luke in South Florida. (laughs) You are now going into, I know the thing. (laughs) You are now completely removing yourself from this culture. I could imagine Mm -hmm. your friends because Mm -hmm. even I grew up in Toronto. Mm -hmm. That's what we were getting from uh, Florida them time (laughs) that we used to wait for them songs if we touch the road. So we could, you know. How was that contrast, you know, between that culture, you know, Jamaica, we have this similar dancehall culture, mm-hmm. but here, 
this is a huge part of the the, 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 the culture for black people. How mm. was that navigating these two clashing? Um, well, it's cultures. interesting because I attended the Seminole uh, High School in Miami, in Miami, okay. Miami Northwestern Senior okay. High School, where Luke attended. Okay. You know, the Miami Northwestern Bulls. Okay. I mean, we're we're renowned, okay. and um, so it was really, I think, because you know, I want to attribute that to me being an only child, okay. and I think that only children are they always go within i i didn't have you yeah. know siblings so i always read yeah. i always thought because i was raised by my grandparents i wasn't so kind of exactly yes. and so that is what you know allowed me to transition so yes. seamlessly really into rastafari because yes. i have been thinking about life you know and then i go on to become a philosopher so yes. i've always been very thought yeah. oriented so yeah uh, that's a that's a theme we're going to come mm -hmm. forward to so high school um take us out of graduation mm -hmm. um what was your life like upon your graduation you're now rastafari fully embraced what's the next move um <laughs> Married. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I put that. I put that really nicely. I was going to say being snatched up by an older Rastafari okay, man. Okay. You know, okay, we're looking. Gonna yeah, we're going to tread lightly. Yeah, we're going to tread lightly. Tread lightly. Um, but yeah, so it was marriage. Yes, yes. At an early age. So you were. What? How old were you when you were married? Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay, mm -hmm. so right at eighteen, mm -hmm. you're married. How, what was that transition? Because. Uh, this is very important um this channel we are really advocating for the family you know to come forward so becoming a wife what was that journey like for the eye at such a young age um it was bewildering okay uh because again a lot you know the older we get the more we reflect on how much our childhood shapes yes, i and i yes. and so because i did not have any siblings not only did I become a wife and a mother early, but I also married a widower. Mm. So at the age of 21, I was raising six children. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it was very, um, it was different. Yes. Um, it was uncharted territory for me, you know. But So you were thrust immediately into the role of wife and mother. Mm -hmm. um, but I can see through your works a nurturing pirates, you know what I mean, in terms of the institute, because the Lilla Institute requires nurturing. You have to nurture the seed of, of the thought, the, the, the curriculum, all of these things. So um, it's uh, starting to take shape. So uh, when, how old were you when you had your first child? Uh, I was 18. So it, right away. Mm -hmm. So your mother to six mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. and then you had another child well no i was i gave birth okay i have four biological children okay. Okay. but then i raised three other oh, children three other so children. I, i'm really okay. a mother of seven okay a mother mm -hmm. of seven and, mm -hmm. and what what lessons did you learn at that time in terms of just balancing all of these new human beings you have a husband he's an older virgin Mm -hmm. How how were you balancing or what were the lessons that you were learning at this time? Well, I learned at an early um, early on into the marriage that having all of those, like you said, human beings that you're responsible mm -hmm. for, self-preservation is a must. Okay. I learned that you have to carve out a part, keep a part of yourself sacred mm -hmm. to yourself, for yourself, because if not, you can get lost in, in all of in everything in motherhood yes. and being a wife right i i knew because remember i had cultivated all of this time yes. learning myself yes. and i valued who i had discovered mm -hmm. and so i was going to make sure that that woman that mm -hmm. young woman mm -hmm. did not get overshadowed mm -hmm. um did not get dominated mm -hmm. you know so yeah i had i learned Self-care and self-preservation. Self-preservation. Um, take us up to the establishment of the Haile Selassie Learning Center because this was a historic triumph, I would say, for South Florida. Mm -hmm. um, 
young mother, you know, how was that journey and what led you to the establishment of this learning center? Right. Well, um, I think at the time that the learning center was established, mm -hmm. my youngest might have been maybe 14 mm -hmm. at the time. And I just knew having raised all of these Rastafari youths, I had seen what would happen to them once they entered into public school. Okay. And I saw how we would turn over as a community, our prized possessions, our children, mm -hmm. and then have them return to I&I. &I, mm -hmm. And we would see all of these influences from the outside. Mm -hmm. And so as an adult I and, and as a community member, I felt like I had been irresponsible. Mm -hmm. I felt as if um, I felt false, mm -hmm. you know, to be able uh, to, to talk to my youths and tell them you must uphold Rastafari, you know, when this isn't a liberty that they ask to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it was my responsibility if I was going to require for them to be firm soldiers within this liberty mm -hmm. that I needed to give them the support. And so the, the support required mm -hmm. infrastructure. It required a place, even if it was just on a Saturday, even if I couldn't open up an institution Monday through Friday, but on Saturdays and Sundays and Friday nights, I could host events for mm -hmm. Rastafari youths. When there was spring break, I held a spring break camp, mm -hmm. summer break, I held a summer break camp, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. And remember by this time I had become, um, I had started reaching rank I think I was an assistant principal okay. at the time that I opened. So I knew the educational system. Okay, let's stick a pin because we didn't talk about your professional development. Mm -hmm. Let's rewind a little bit. Graduated from high school, married, children, professionally. Where are you? You know, How, how does the professional um, journey track? Um, well, you know, my parents, uh, all of them, parents and grandparents mm -hmm. had always instilled in me that education was a must. Okay. It was necessary. Um, and I also, I've always been smart. Mm -hmm. Always. Um, that's just something that, you know, as a, a young child growing mm -hmm. up, I realized I was always a teacher's pet. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I had this education thing down pat. Mm -hmm. Once I got my first degree, mm -hmm. I just started churning them out. <laughs> really? What what um, age were you at when you got the first degree? Um, because of the children, mm -hmm. and, and I had my children like they say, like steps, mm -hmm. you know. So I think my first degree should have been since I graduated at seventeen, mm -hmm. four years, twenty one, probably about twenty four. Okay. But don't worry about that. <laughs> Once that started, and I said, "Wow, this is nothing." Yeah bachelor's yeah. in philosophy, double major in English. And I'm a philosophy minor too. You know. Look at you. You know, I tell them most mm -hmm. people who go on to study law mm -hmm. usually have poli-sci yeah. or philosophy yeah. as an undergrad degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so the degrees just kept coming. Mm -hmm. African New World Studies. And then my degrees are very diverse because okay. it was like whatever I felt like studying, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so once I did all of that, you know, I realized, I said, you know, I've got to take what I've learned. Like if you go on my website, mm -hmm. I, I have, I say something we'll like. We'll put the website up here so that everybody can go right. there and support the system. Give right. thanks. I say something like, it's the job of, uh, it's the job of those of us who have been trained, mm -hmm. right? In these dysfunctional educational systems mm -hmm. to take that knowledge and dismantle it brick by brick. Mm -hmm. So that was the iris that I had when I created the Heidi Selassie First Learning Center. Let me take, because I had, not only did I do well, but I had begun to become renowned in the area of culturally responsive pedagogy. Okay. So I took that and pin. brought it to pedagogy. the center. Pedagogy, some people lost, right? So mm -hmm. pedagogy, define it. Right, the definition of pedagogy mm -hmm. is the training of children or the education of children. Okay. Juxtapose that with andragogy, which will be the education educating of adults. Okay. So petty, like pediatrician, mm -hmm. okay. kid, okay. pedagogy, okay. yeah. Okay. All right, so um, you are well equipped by the emperor in terms of inspiration, getting all of these degrees, your mother, why the Haile Selassie Institute? And then also you started on the weekend 
uh, how did it transition into a, a full-time institute? Well, at the same time that I had, I established a center, mm -hmm. I also established a idol shop. Okay. You know, that goes yes, hand in yes, hand, yes, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so, so I had two businesses mm -hmm. in addition to working at the same, uh, as, a, um, as okay. an administrator. And where's the king man at this time? Is what, what work was he? He ran the idol shop. Okay. okay. And so. I don't want the Belgian say like, now leave out the, the king man. Uh, in this, you were you had a king at the time, right? Yes, yes. So he yeah. was running the idol shop. You were running the um, Haile Selassie Center part time. Part time, okay. So I would, you know, at this time I had adult youths too. Okay. <clears throat> so they would actually open the center. The center would be open from like maybe three to nine. Okay. And I would say, hey, you know, you all go and open it while I'm working. Mm -hmm. We and you were working as a principal. Assistant said, principal assistant at the principal. time. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it goes from, you know, those hours mm -hmm. to being full time okay. when my husband at the time um, went over and began to man it full time. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we kind of consolidated okay. both of the businesses Give into that. one. Okay. Give and then um, what type of item were you selling in the shop? And that was the food I would imagine for the children during mm -hmm. their instruction. Yeah. What type of food was being sold there? Um, Ito. Good <laughs> Ito, too. Yeah. Okay, you know, okay. very, we were one of the first Ito shops in Miami. Okay. You know, and so. What was the um, name of the shop? Ethiopian Marketplace. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And beautiful shop, you so know. It doesn't no longer exist. No. Okay. we Like I said, we consolidated both mm -hmm. businesses. Okay. Um, And so, you know, so. Uh, one of the things that we would do too with the youths is not only feed them mm -hmm. idle, but they would learn how to prepare food. Wow, mm -hmm. um, this is making me sad. That does, it, does the institute still exist to this day yeah. in the same form? So it's not, and it's still a physical place, mm -hmm. but it's not since I'm no longer a part of it. The focus is not as much child education, but more community okay. education. My focus was the youth because I thought that they were the ones yes. who had received yes. a dirt, you know, in that mm -hmm. area. So I give thanks that it's still there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to go take the lion voice there. We're going to have to check out the Haile Selassie Learning Center. I haven't been in South Florida for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And when you're so, there, you come by Lala Bella yes, Institute. Yes, and I will come by Lala Bella. And we're mm -hmm. going to get to Lala Bella Institute. So much, family. Lion Pride, make sure you see what's going on here. Big up the sponsors, Seabass, uh, Romia King Design. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe. And if you subscribe, you're part of the Lion Pride. This is a joy because I've known the sister for some time, but now when you, you see the story, you under understand why, you know, because coming from your childhood, curiosity, the, the fascination with education, the acquisition of degrees, establishment of a family, establishment of a family, which is an institution, establishment of the Haile Selassie Learning Center. What happens, you know, this this is, I'm, I'm assuming, a, a highlight time for South Florida Rastafari oh, community. Definitely. I, I'd like to say that the Haile Selassie First Learning Center brought uptown Rasta yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the ghetto Rasta them okay. <laughs> together, okay. you know, okay. because there was a division, Yes, you know, um, and that was wonderful to see, you know, the, the entire community because we had some real seminal programs. Yes. Like one of the seminal programs of the center was the Empress Menon um, Mother's Day event. Okay. So as opposed to holding um, Mother's Day in May, I and I Dean. That was at the time when we were ignorant and we thought that March 25th. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, that yes. time was her earth light. Yes. And so we would always have a Mother's Day event for the empresses in the community. And it was beautiful. You know, of course it was free. You know, Sistrum would get upset with me mm -hmm. because I wouldn't allow them to partner or help. I didn't want them to do anything. I just mm -hmm. wanted them to come, sit down, have the Bridgmans cater to you, have the youths do performances, get your gift bag, and just feel, you know, be honored. That's beautiful. So the Bridgman then planned the event with the eye? Yes. Okay, gift bag, yes. gift bag. And does this event still happen? Yes, it gift still bands. does. So um, how is the South Florida uh, Rastafari community right now? Would you say 
it's still vibrant or does it because I can say for Washington DC we definitely are not in our glory days you know um, yes we gather for ISIS but we used to have ISIS every strong mm. for example now it's you know a couple times a year mm -hmm. um, what is the vibration like in South Florida with the community now? well it's the same thing you were definitely not in our heyday the eye came as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. remember to the Redlands, didn't you come to the Redlands, to the Isis and the Redlands? I know that I know, brethren yeah. from Atlanta came. I don't, I, I don't, I never you don't, came to You didn't Atlanta. come? Yes, okay, yes. well, I know Bingy Sean came, yes, yes. and you know, I know, you know, your, your yes. counterparts came. Yeah, the cohort. Yes, your you know, cohort, my, your my cohort. Classmates, my yes. school, my yes. schoolmates. Exactly, yes. exactly. And so that's when we were in our glory yes, days. Yes. I mean, people would come from all over internationally because we were such a very interesting Nyabingi house, you know, meaning that um, we were very diverse. Culture, as you know, is from Haiti. Yeah. I'm... Um, you know, an African born here in America. Culture is your PR arm. You always talk about South Florida. I, I know because it's, <laughs> because it, we were that's that's our foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which was really really important. Yeah. Um, uh, the brethren who was the founder um, was from St. Vincent. Okay. You know, we had ones. Oh man, it was. What was the brethren name? Rasa Beatty. Okay, so yeah, yeah Kingman was the founder. my husband. Yeah, yeah at the time. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. he was the the. The um, one that was holding the ground. Right. So, so in terms of uh, the other mansions, were they was there a presence in South Florida? Oh tribes? yes, uh, not twelve tribes, but Bobo Ashanti, Ashanti. Yeah. definitely. So it was really Naya Bingi and Bobo Ashanti, and then ones who were non -den non denominational, okay. a lot of non denominational rock right? And I could imagine because there's such a large Caribbean community in South Florida that the community here was massive at one. Like oh time. yes absolutely um it was massive it was very diverse you know in thought you know um and it was thriving it was a beautiful place for i as a young rastafari woman who didn't have any parentage from the caribbean and didn't have exposure it was a wonderful way of being exposed because and people laugh because um people say sometimes i sound like i come from the caribbean yeah. It all depends on the day, right? <laughs> but it's because, you know, my bestie is from Trinidad. My, you know, this one is from Haiti. This, you know what I'm saying? So it's a real, it, yeah, yeah, it's a real positive energy. You know? And did you get to travel to the Naya Mingels in Jamaica or any of the other islands as well? I did when I was, when I was about 21. Mm -hmm. And, but Miami also had something very special. We had yes. the elders yes. to come, and I believe 94, Yes, which was where I got a private audience with Bungo Watu. Okay. And where Bungo Watu after, and, and I like to tell this story really quickly because yes. I know, you know, the audience, yes. you have a time frame. But I remember um, our Nyabingi house was a rebellious. We had gotten a, a real <laughs> little... You know, nasty little title. We were like the, we yeah. were a firehouse, yeah. but we weren't Jamaican for yeah. the most part, yeah. you know. So when the elders came in 94, we were so excited because that was Bungawatu, Sam Brown, Ma Ashanti. I mean, you yes. know. These are legendary. And, right, legendary. Elders, and yeah. we wanted so very much to have an audience with them, mm -hmm. but we were refused mm -hmm. an audience because... The person who brought them didn't feel like we were worthy oh, of an audience. Oh. So I remember at 21 saying, that's not going to fly. Mm -hmm. So I drove about an hour mm. to where Bungo Watcher was staying. And I remember just going there and just knocking on the door and saying, I want to speak to Bungo Watcher. And I remember people looking like, who is this? Number mm. one, Bungo Watcher came out. First question right off the bat. Why can't women approach the altar and prophesy? And I remember Bongo Watu looking at me like, why are you so bright and fancy, you know? And he said, well, because a woman has an issue of blood mm -hmm. and she won't be able to preach or prophesize until she's gone through menopause. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm 21. Mm -hmm a long way for me you know and I said that just I said but anyway 
Women don't come to ISIS when they have their cycle. So that really doesn't fly. Mm -hmm. So I remember, and at some point, he said, let me let me talk to you in private. Mm -hmm. Because people had started gathering around and it was mm -hmm. clear I wasn't going to stop. Yeah. We went, we had a private audience. And I remember he began to quote scriptures from mm -hmm. the prophecy. Mm -hmm. And something very miraculous happened. Mm -hmm. Every prophecy that he began to quote, mm. I finished. Mm. Every Psalms he started, I finished. Mm. I had read the Bible, mm. but I had no knowledge that I had retained it to mm. that point. And at that point, he stopped and he looked at me and he said, the eye is the daughter of Jesse. Mm. That was it. Mm. And then he went on to tell me some other things about mm. metaphysics, mm -hmm transformations of Haile Selassie the first some mm -hmm. things that were very deep and at 21 I didn't quite I don't know if I necessarily believed them or mm -hmm. understood them but now I understand and not only believe but know okay you know so that was a wonderful experience too and um gift and time at Bongo Watu briefly in um other stone and that was a very powerful you know he stopped us at the gates of his gates and blocking sounds and mm -hmm. these things. So, so you know, you yeah, don't know, yeah, right? Yeah. I didn't get the full power of Bongo because that time he was bedridden. You know, oh. his health had failed. Mm -hmm. But the voice and the command and we were there for hours where he was just mm -hmm. holding court, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And um so I, I and I give thanks because I came in on the tail end of a lot of those the elders, mm -hmm. you know, Raspidal, mm -hmm. Bongo Watu, you know, a lot of them I just was able to glimpse them before they transitioned. So, in terms of that time now, what was going through your mind now? You're immersed in this culture. Are you completely disconnected from your African-American family um, now that you're in Rastafari? Are you balancing the two worlds? How is that manifesting? Oh, I always was very close to my family. Okay, um, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Yes. So my mother eventually started growing locks. Okay. <laughs> you know, because you know when you stand firm in your conviction yes. and they look at your life and they say, Well, you know, it's not so bad. You know, <laughs> so no, I, I was always very, very close to my family. To hear that. So take us to the um the Lalabella Institute now. Um from the Haile Selassie. This is the glory days of South Florida. Um, and I think a documentary should be made mm -hmm. about that time. Because mm -hmm. even myself now, I'm thinking, since I started doing this work, we need a documentary about the Bing Girls in D.C. Because mm -hmm. so many ones are transitioning. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist anymore, you know what I mean? Right. And we take for granted these things, but there will come a time when this is valuable for a generation to know how we, you know, came about. So um, how did Lalibella Institute um, manifest from the Haile Selassie or, or how did that transition happen? Well, I realized that um, what I, my vision mm -hmm. for the Haile Selassie First Learning Center mm -hmm. was no longer the vision. Okay. And so um, as a re instead of really creating a battle, mm -hmm. you know, and really, because that was my baby. I gave birth to that. Yes. You know, I was, at least I was one of the parents. Yes. Um, so it happened in response to what I did not see happening there. Okay. Um, and also because I'd gone to Rallock, I think in 2000 and I want to say 15 or 16, and, and big up Rala, that's a key milestone yeah. in the liberty. That yeah. manifestation, no matter how brief, mm -hmm. was a very powerful mm -hmm. manifestation. Ex exactly. But um, you went to Rala. I went to Rala, and I was asked to moderate. Yes. And um, the year before, I guess there had been certain charges given mm -hmm. um, regarding um, what we needed in order to make the, the liberty a bit more cohesive mm -hmm. and a bit more progressive. So I remember moderating and saying, well, you know, we need, again, more institutions yes. that focus on our education. Mm -hmm. And since I didn't see the Haile Selassie First Learning Center fulfilling that vision anymore, then Lalabella Institute. And Lalabella Institute, just the name Lalabella itself. Um, but I I know about the Rakhune churches. Yes. 
but I always saw those churches as not only churches, but mystery schools. Something yes. intuitively said yes. they're not only praising Mariam mm -hmm. and, and Jesus, right? But that there's just like even in Kemet or in ancient Kush, you know, these religious temples, they all they serve multifaceted purposes. Yes. Yes. And so I said, what would that type of religion, I mean, what would that type of education look like? in a mystery school, because I'm from Jerusalem school, yes. right? And so I wanted to create it, create an institution where ones could come and get deep knowledge mm. that they couldn't get any place else, okay. you know? And so that's what, that's what happens at the Institute. So what's the uh, mission statement of the London Miller Institute in terms of what is it, you know, what is its aim and objective? Well, it, its primary aim started out, the aim has somewhat changed okay. to provide culturally responsive education, okay. not only for Rastafari youths, but for African youths, period, okay. right? Um, but then again, I am an instrument of my community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the parents, if the mothers, you know, um, showcase a need or express a need and a desire, to learn more his majesty he commanded me to teach in mm. the vision so i thought i was supposed to teach children mm. i did at one point yes. however i now know that my classroom is my institute mm. my my manuals are the books that i write mm -hmm. and the demographic that i serve um, it's primarily that of the Rastafari woman. Now we touch on the blue fire. Mm. Um, talk to I and I. How did the blue fire arise? What is the blue fire? Is the hottest flame? Because uh, I've heard it. Um, we had a reasoning around it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and just give a, 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 a overview of the blue fire. Okay. Well, again, mm -hmm. vision based. You know, mm -hmm. not only am I a philosopher, mm -hmm. I'm also a prophetess. Okay. So a lot of things come to me through vision okay. and and iditation, not necessarily only vision, mm -hmm. but also through third eye yes. or brow chakra meditation. Okay. And so I remember intro, being introspective again, thinking and asking their Ivy Majesty, why was it so difficult for a Rastafari woman mm -hmm. of a certain level of strength, a uh, certain knowledge level, why did women like myself mm -hmm. sometimes receive, you know, a pushback mm -hmm. within the community? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why weren't ones just embracing us mm -hmm. for who we are? Mm -hmm. And just in having that meditation, I received a message and the message was very clear. Mm -hmm. I still, I was in St. Croix at the mm -hmm. time, summer rain, and um, like that one. <laughs> and so the answer was because her fire is blue. Mm -hmm. I knew absolutely, I, I didn't even know what that meant, yeah, yeah. but it came to me just like that. And so mm -hmm. I went on a search. I didn't pay attention in science, but yeah. much, you know, I, I'm a little dry. I like yeah. to read, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in doing my research, because I had to start from the from scratch, mm -hmm. what does this mean? I realized, oh my goodness, okay, blue fire. So when you, you know, flick your lighter, the bottom is blue and then orange, reddish, you know, mm -hmm. but it's that blue flame. You know, that is the hottest one because you paid attention evidently. You yes. knew right away, yes. right, yes. that it was the hottest flame. Well, that caught me because I'm saying, okay, are you saying that the sister and them are hotter flame than the brethren? Is it a competition vibration or, you know, just the whole, because that is going to be what people hear. So I want to just be very clear and let the eye, you know, explain. Because I know the fullness of the eye explain it, but mm -hmm. I want to go out to the, the people you know? good so we can have clarity yes we can have okay clarity. so when after doing the the research from a scientific mm -hmm. standpoint i had to translate that to, to the liberty yes. and the rastafari man is known as the fire mind yes, right yes. and i thought about what it meant to be fiery as a rastafari mm -hmm. man yes. And coming out of the Bingy house, yes. I know what fire is, yes, you know. Yes, yes. And so I thought about it and I said, you know, oftentimes when the brethren blaze fire, 
it's really it's loud. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it sometimes, I mean, I've been in, in situations, not myself personally, yeah. but I've seen some things that have been totally out of control, right? Yeah, yeah. But men, rest of men think it's their right to voice themselves and it's very, that you know, lion. yes, yeah, exactly. Song, yeah. And so I said, well, if her fire is blue, I've seen her fire because I have that fire, yes, right? Yes. But you know, the woman's fire, mm -hmm. we give you a look. That is correct. And it done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yes, and it's, it's that kind of cool kind of yes. fire. But it's hot. It's hot, yes. Because we're not in an arara. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. I don't have to go on, so I'll say it to you calmly. And it'd be just as serious yes. as all of the hoopla. Yeah. So it's not that one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. One, the blue fire is more laser-like mm -hmm. and it's precise. Yes. Whereas the red fire, in my opinion, is more akin to a wildfire. A wildfire can go any kind of way. When you're clearing your land, yes. you need fire to purge the land, purge right? Land. That's blue fire. Mm -hmm. That's that fire that's going to be blazed and burned to purge mm -hmm. and to rebuild. Okay. You understand? So that's, and it is, it's the exemplification of the Ivine feminine within the Rastafari, which is something that has not been explored, Yes, you know? And so that is why it's significant now. And it really isn't a battle. Because if you, my latest book, right, mm -hmm. is what I coined, it's called uh, Between the Fire and Ice, mm -hmm. right? And it's coined a purple flame mm. novel, okay. right? So it's those two fires coming together to create that violet mm -hmm. or that purple flame. Mm -hmm. So we have to come together, but first we must explore who the other is. Mm -hmm. I think the world has explored the Rastafari man, mm -hmm. but the world yeah. hasn't even the tip of the iceberg of the Rastafari woman, besides what they think they know of us, yes. has not been explored. And I and I, I know so many Rastafari sisters, which is why I'm trying to use this platform to really highlight, because a lot of people have not heard. You know, I, I'm surrounded by sisters of all levels, grassroots sisters, but also sisters that have reached the heights of achievement in the professional space. Mm -hmm. So I want to really show both these sides because a lot of people, you know, think the Rastafari sisters don't talk and they're just quiet. They don't know that these are brilliant, bright, shining stars, you know. Um, so in terms of the blue fire, talk to I and I about how the, does the blue fire or are you training the sister in them to be able to, uh, or for us as a, as a people to sustain long-term relationships, stable families, because this is what I'm not seeing in Rastafari. At the moment, you know, I'm seeing a lot of, and, and it's not because of Rastafari, this is across the black mm -hmm. spectrum, you know, it's, it's, these are generational curses that we have not, unfortunately in Rastafari, overcome, although I think we have the tools to overcome them through I and I Majesties, but how does the blue fire contribute to this challenge that confronts us right now? Well, I think Blue Fire contributes to that because mm -hmm. um, all pillars of the Trinity mm -hmm. must be acknowledged yes. and respected. Mm -hmm. You have to know yourself to thine own self be true. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraging Rastafari women to know themselves mm -hmm. outside of who the liberty has defined them to be okay. or who their king man has defined them to be. Okay. But who, who is the I, right? At your very core, mm -hmm. right? Once you take that core being and you couple that mm -hmm. with the liberty of Rastafari, right? Mm -hmm. Not the, not the, the, the part that is, you know, a part of dogma yeah. or a part of patriarchy. But the core, you understand, know which really comes from knowing his majesty, right? And looking at his life and looking at the life of, of Empress Minute, right? Mm -hmm. How do you define patriarchy? Because this is a buzzword. Mm -hmm. That's a hot word right now. How would you define patriarchy? Well, in layman's term, mm -hmm. dominance, mm -hmm. you know, just just uh, aggressive dominance mm -hmm. over, over women. Okay. 
you know, over, um, I mean, just, you know, the thought, mm -hmm. you know, of, of thinking that one, simply because one is born a male, mm -hmm. has the right, right, mm -hmm. to suppress a woman or to dominate a woman, mm -hmm. right? And we know that patriarchy mm -hmm. is a Western concept. Mm -hmm. We know you had Mama Waleti on who talked about the matriarchal shift. Mm -hmm. We know that um, especially the Kushite mm -hmm. traditions mm -hmm. were very matriarchy. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, matriarchal. Mm -hmm. So we know that patriarchy really isn't ours. We have mm -hmm. adopted it mm -hmm. and even adapted it in some cases. Mm -hmm. You understand? So that's how I, I view mate, um, patriarchy. How would you look at the Solomonic dynasty? Because some would argue that it's a patriarchal structure, how Ethiopia evolved mm -hmm. through the emperors the system. There were some female queens, mm -hmm. um, but largely, you know, um, you know, even with the child marriage system that His Majesty and Empress men in abolish, you know, women had very little say in terms of how they moved mm -hmm. through that society at the upper echelon. Mm -hmm. We're intellectual. We're going to go deep into the thing, you know, so mm -hmm. I won't get there because mm -hmm. I know that you can go there mm -hmm. and you're studied on these topics. Um, so how would you define the Solomonic dynasty within that um, context? Well, first of all, mm -hmm. when, it, when we go forward to the whole Solomon and Sheba story, mm -hmm. I always view Sheba as the real wise one. Okay. Right? Because um, if the Ark of the Covenant, right, mm -hmm. flew in, in the dream, flew from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, then, you know, the Solomonic di dynasty mm -hmm. owes its everything to Makeda, right? Yeah. Because she was the one who went mm -hmm. and made that connection. And so as a result, she brought it to Ethiopia. So it was her doing, yes. right? It was yes. her wise mind. Right. Her initiative exactly. and perseverance because that was the longest um, at the time and the largest overland journey of a monarch mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because um, people have to understand when Queen Ashiba was moving, it was the whole court, you know, this probably exactly. took a year for her to reach mm -hmm. from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, ten, you know, the whole army is moving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a huge undertaking to move that many people in that time. Um, so yeah, so definitely. But to answer your question mm -hmm. more specifically, I think when we think about ancient Kush, mm -hmm. right, knowing that it was yeah. um, uh, matriarchal in its foundation, right, and then we look at the migration of the Oromo people, mm -hmm. right, um, who who became the Oromo, the Kushites yes. who became the Oromo, yes. right, and we look at why that migration happened. That migration happened as a result of Christianity, mm -hmm. as well as is all these outside influences. Mm -hmm. So the Solomonic dynasty, even though it is, um, you know, based on Judaic principles mm -hmm. and Christian principles, to me, mm -hmm. is still a result of outside influences. Um, I'm going to push back a little mm -hmm. because we know the African Hebrews or the, the, the originators yes the romans adopted um christianity but christianity didn't start with europeans you mm -hmm. know and i think in the pan-african community um because of the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade we kind of just paint that broad brush against um judaism which you know the hebrews are, were africans mm -hmm. you know there's so much i just had uh reverend kamal uh, breakdown, you know, from the genetic, from the historical, from the anthropological, you know, all of the evidence is very clear that the, the Hebrews were black people and that they were an extension of the Nile Valley civilization mm -hmm. and not um, foreign to it, which is why, you know, even we spoke about King Hezekiah, all of these, when you look at their iconography on their royal stamps, you know, as Kemetic um, insignias. Um, and these things so but what cannot be denied mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. is the fact that all of these things mm -hmm. have been bastardized mm -hmm. all of them have been um they've been adapted you know they none of them are mm -hmm. in its pure form mm -hmm. so even if your argument is and i agree with you we mm -hmm. know that everything mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. came out of the continent of Africa, yes. right? You know, at least a little bit of it. And so 
I will argue that when you now the interesting part about Ethiopia mm -hmm. today specifically is is focus on Mary. Yes. Mary. Mariam. Mariam. Yeah, Mariam. Not so much Jessa. Yes. If you really so deep down inside, hidden there, there's still their that focus. That's calling. right. Yes, yes. You know, but a lot of things have to be hidden. And you know Ethiopia is very mystical. Very mystical. You know, so and the prophecy says, Who has eyes, let them see, who has ears, let them hear. So I would argue because once I realized that. And I realized how Mary, right, how that term M-A-R-Y is really M-E-R-I, right, coming out of Cush. Okay. Mary is a title which means beloved. Okay. And so in ancient Cush and ancient Kemet, a one would say that you are Mary Isis, mm -hmm. beloved of Isis, mm -hmm. right? So when these same people, because remember, we're talking about the same ones who mm -hmm. migrated. Yes. So they no longer mm -hmm. call on ISIS. Yes. But the term Mary continues. But it's no longer M-E-R-I. Mm -hmm. It's M-A-R-Y. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer Mary of ISIS. But Mary, that same Mary, is still ISIS. Um, this is why I brought this conversation to Princess Chaz and I, because I knew she was going to take it in an unexpected direction. Um, this is very fascinating because you're right. When you look at Ethiopia and um, the prevalence of Mariam in um, the holy days, fasting mm -hmm. days, um, you really have that matriarchal component, which I would argue most African mm -hmm. cultures, it's there. Um, the pushback I would push back is that Ethiopia being unconquered, um, preserved to I, the, um, now I would argue later, you know, starting with the Portuguese coming in, there were corruption for, you know, um, Falecidos, uh, I'm probably saying his name right, you know, mm -hmm. who converted know. briefly mm -hmm. to, to Catholicism and these things. So there was corruption that did creep in. We see the white, um, uh, Yeshua that has crept mm -hmm. into Ethiopia. So I'm not saying that Ethiopia, the church, is pure, but in terms of coming down the line in um, the Christianity that was preserved, mm -hmm. you know, we see the bass drum, all of these original, you know, the African um, Christian components in Ethiopia, but yet still, you know, um, the male, again, was paramount in terms of the, the pearl passing through the male lineage, the, the covenant of David, which says, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you will have a male child to sit on your throne as long as the sun and the moon endure. All of these things. So, But I'm, that's okay. Yes. <laughs> Having the male sit mm -hmm. on the throne mm -hmm. is fine yes. because we know mm -hmm. that the black woman's lap is the first throne. That is correct. This is where you learn as a baby to keep your back straight on yes. your mother's lap. That is correct. So it doesn't matter who's out there. Mother Earth. Mother That's, right. Seed. That's right. That That's right. That's right. That's okay. right. Especially in ancient Kush. Mm -hmm. Women ruled they ruled on the throne, but they also rule all queen mothers rule behind the throne. Even in the Ashanti today. That's right. Coming, coming down the queen That's mother right. is the one who determines who the Asante is. And the sacred things you keep hidden anyway. Mm -hmm. The true. sacred things you don't put out front. And protection. Exactly. That's know. what I mean. Yes, yes. The line, the male line is the one who guards the territory, preserve the territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the female line is the one who set the table. Mm -hmm. Um so the balance, and I'm glad we're talking about the balance. So it doesn't one doesn't have to diminish the other. Oh no for them to work in that divine harmony because this is the if we solve that challenge mm -hmm. this is what is going to lead to the because i tell people that the glory days for rastafari are ahead of us they are not in the 70s and because a lot of ones think you know we had to go through a period of of you know searching because i in particular my classmates and i we are the generation of them that seek his face because I was born in 77, his majesty had disappeared already. We didn't have, 
his mind is on the throne. We couldn't go on CBC or BBC mm -hmm. and see the king on the throne, trotting through creation. We had to literally go find this um, this this emperor and, and seek his face. So my problem right now, because we're going to get real. We're going mm -hmm. through the South Africa, but I know you can go real mm -hmm. too. We have a lot of brethren, um, in my estimation, that are underachieving, um, not seeking their purpose. Mm -hmm. um, they got caught up in the uh, acquisition of uh, the female underneath region, you know, um, chasing the physical lustful um, component. I'm being real because I know a lot of brethren. Um, and therefore, um, I put a lot of responsibility on the bridging because I, I do believe that the black man is supposed to lead the black family. Now, um, how does that sit with the blue fire energy or how does male leadership in terms of the family, how would you reconcile? Do you see that as a thing? Do you think it's a co-leadership situation? Do you think it's, you know, the man should lead the woman? How do you look at that family structure? Well, it's really apropos that we should mm -hmm. be discussing this right now. Yes. I think in the last study group, I do a study yes. group, we read the speech yes. um, that His Majesty gave to the women's seminar. Women yes. seminar. Yes. Exactly. Big up I do. Um, I know yes. development. We have a by um, every other strong. We have a study group. We study the teachings of His Imperial Majesty. I am very happy. Uh, that was a baby of mine, you know, mm. um, to start that study group in 2008 and it persists to this day. It's now international. So really give thanks um, to have ones like the I would continue. Yeah, since I was saying in that speech, how he um, charges, he gives the African woman a charge, you know, um, it's a charge telling her that she must be on par with her her male partner yes. with with men right and the works that have to happen and he makes no distinction he doesn't say well because you are a female you know this should be your role his distinction is those who are fit need to do the job yes. those who are unfit need to learn or those who need training need to learn mm -hmm. So um, within the blue fire order, because we also have an order, yes. we have an I treat okay. and then there's a cohort. We this we are the first Rastafari woman's order okay. akin to a sorority. Yes. Um, so for I and I, you know, it's really important that um, the Rastafari woman's leadership be acknowledged, uh, be utilized mm -hmm. by I and I, by the nation. So I don't see it as... Um, the Rastafari man leading mm -hmm. the family mm -hmm. as a solo effort. Mm -hmm. I see it more as a joint effort um, because clearly we all have different skill sets mm -hmm. and I think we ought to be intelligent and savvy enough to learn from each other. All right. Decision to make man and woman mm -hmm. disagree whose decision is going to lead that decision. You want to get um, some idle string bean. I want to get some uh, veggie peas or something like that. We only can make one decision, disagree, who is a tiebreaker? How do we come to that problem? Probably the woman, <laughs> because she probably is going to look at it from a nutritional standpoint and say, you know, we need more of this in our living versus that. The brethren might say, what's cheaper? <laughs> She might say, but you know, it's organic, mm -hmm. but we, I and I need this, you know. No, I'm, yeah. I'm just jesting because yeah. I know you that was yes. in jest, yes. but um, no, there, there are times when I think we all must truths and right stand. Yes. That's it, truths and right stand, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think if you know your partner, mm -hmm. um, you know, if your partner is just attempting to exert a certain type of force or dominance. Yes. Or if what the person is saying is really sound. Mm -hmm. And if it's sound, then that's it. You understand it. There has to mm -hmm. be a level of compromise between the Rastafari man and Rastafari yes. woman. Um, and I say this because there are times, and I've been married now 16 years, been with my queen 20 years. There are times where you're not going to agree. Mm -hmm. And both sides are reasonable. Right. So there has to be, in I'm on an estimation, an established leader. Because 
you can't have two heads because two head is not going to work. Um, that's why, right, you know. So that by default, are you the established I have leader? To be, I have to you, be. You, you know, I have to be not, you know. No, I have to be as a man, you know, once you're, <laughs> you're um, because <laughs> when we look at even Haile Slas in Empress Menin, what mm -hmm. did he say? She was obedient to I as Sarah was unto Abraham. You want me to go into that? I want I, to I don't it. think, I don't this think so. No, this is, this is what I want. This is what I want. I've been waiting because this is so important. This is this is one of the, um, above and beyond all of the challenges because of the rust of our brethren and sister in them, something is not connecting. Mm -hmm. So this um, reasoning to I is probably the most germane important reasoning that we have as a community because until we seal that gap mm -hmm. you know everything we do will come to naught we will build institutions and nobody will be there to inherit them so, so let's 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 touch, let's, touch, let's, it, touch, touch let's touch on that really touch quickly it. okay right. so in the abraham because mm -hmm. i i heard that too i read yes. that too yes. so in the abraham and mm -hmm. sarah story yes where was in what instance was sarah obedient um there were several instances, you know. Um, what do you think was the biggest one? The biggest one was probably um, having that faith when Abraham told her she would conceive a man child, or it could be when they went to Egypt. That, on that's the, the one, Kwasi. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. You, I'm, I'm leaning back. <laughs> <laughs> Walk right on into it. <laughs> <laughs> you just heard her in Egypt when, you know, instead of say you're my sister and, you know, before Pharaoh sent some people to come kill me mm -hmm. and uh, let's see if we can get you. And she did that. Mm -hmm. um, but So let's just point. stop right yes, there. Yes. So my point is, in that case, her obedience, yes. right? And then I always wonder about word sound. Yes. And the translation, mm -hmm. you understand, yes. from maybe he didn't say obedient. But let's yes. just say that he did say yes. obedient. Yes. In that case, she saved his life. She did. Okay? She did. Um, because without that, Pharaoh had already made her his wife or had already decided to make her his wife. Yes. Okay? So if that obedient, right, mm -hmm. just doing what I ask you to do mm -hmm. in order to save us, mm -hmm. if you want to use Haile Selassie and Empress Menon as an example, mm -hmm. when was Empress Menon instrumental in the saving of Ethiopia mm -hmm. or in the saving of the life, mm -hmm. you understand? We know that Empress Menon chanted and had a monastery built in Palestine, mm -hmm. right? For the sole purpose at that time mm -hmm. of using her energy mm -hmm. and the energy of those people who she brought in as mm -hmm. priests and savants and mm -hmm. all of these different ones, right? To help chant from an iritical perspective for Ethiopia's freedom, mm -hmm. okay? So I, when I, when I hear that and I say, wow, Abraham, Sarah saved Abraham. Mm -hmm. Well, she was obedient to me too, because this was my my part of the battlefield mm -hmm. was the League of Nations. Yeah. Her part of the battlefield was chanting in Palestine. You yes, understand? And, and she also, when uh, Zaidu too had his biases surrounded, and, and she, she brought her the the, Yes, I. Yes, so you know, that to me is good. the obedience. That yes. obedience is not what we think of being submissive, that obedience is mm -hmm. side to side. But submissive also doesn't mean subservient, mm -hmm. you know, because I can, someone can be submissive and still be Empress Menon is an Aries. Mm -hmm. Aries women are not submissive. My wife is an Aries too. And um, they're fiery. Mm. They're fiery. But April my, Aries or, yeah. or March Aries? Uh, April. April what? April 18. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's mm -hmm. leaving out of Aries a little yeah, bit. Okay. okay. Oh, she's very fiery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm a fireman, so you don't know all that. <laughs> but the, <laughs> but the, the, this is good because what happened now is that um, we have to figure out. There's another um, example that I wanted to use mm -hmm. um, in terms of that concept of male leadership. Because if we look at the revised constitution of Ethiopia, um, you know, there's not uh, a provision for um, co-leadership. 
with the with the empress mm -hmm. um also when we look at the coronation she did not um share in the anointing oil mm -hmm. which was tied to governorship his majesty was very clear to express that in the um autobiography that was one of the few details that he he put in there so but I, Kushite women mm -hmm. who remember that's the lineage yes. right that a romo lineage right from Empress Menon, that lineage. We see Negus Mikael. Yes. We see them Jesse Jesse man. Yes, we sir. see mm -hmm. um Ross McConan. You yes, understand? Yes. We see who they are, right? Yes, yes. So but women don't always have I lead from the forefront. Yes. Sistrin in my cadre, we lead from the front. Mm -hmm. Not everybody leads that way. Yes. Because if it is true that Empress Menon is the most trusted advisor yes, yes. of Haile Selassie the first yes. you take the opinion and the advice of your advisor yes. I don't have to be out front we know half of these speeches and I'm not talking about his majesty yes. but these leaders they write they don't write their speeches yes you understand his majesty didn't write a lot of his speeches either mm -hmm. you know he had a speech writer mm -hmm. so, so but, you can leave from yeah. behind too no definitely and I I, I don't um say that to diminish the role of the sister because i do think sister must be leaders because they're leading the household most mm -hmm. of the time the brethren them as you say are not the, the front line of raising the children mm -hmm. so to i it just means that there's uh so to to i it just means that there is a there is a a clear um you know kind of uh, order within the, the family home mm -hmm. where you know it is known that the, the brethren leads the household however um any brethren and i say this to brethren any brethren and i say that i say this to brethren any brethren who is leading without taking wise counsel from his sister is not very smart because the sister and them are gonna and you and you you don't want to be with a sister who's a yes woman either you know who's just going to tell you what you want to hear because that's dangerous you want someone who's going to challenge the eye but you know for, for for i as a king the king have to lead and yet the king has to lead with confidence because sometimes the, the queen is not going to even see the eye vision and when i talk to brethren about vetting their queen um because my channel we are cultivating the rastafari man to lead the Rastafari future. We don't have name blue fire or anything, but I see where I want to see more families. And a lot of brethren to I um, are not, you know, grew up in families where there was no male in the home. So they don't even know what masculinity looked like. I was blessed. My parents are together till today. My father, I've never seen my father raise his voice to my mother mm -hmm. in life, you know? But when my father make a decision, I hit that, you know what I mean? And my mother might not like it and she might complain and sometimes she will do something else. But, you know, that's going to be the direction that the family goes. And that's how I man um, grew up and that's how I man live. Now, we see right now, um, Regin and Sistrin come together and then they're not chatting together a little more. And I'm thinking, if we have two strong wills, it's because there has not been an agreement in terms of how decisions are going to be made. There's not a decision on whose vision we're going to pursue. And to eye for a relationship to work, these things have to be outlined and, and agreed upon. How do I see it? Um, I think that you definitely have to have communication mm -hmm. in a successful relationship. Mm -hmm. I think that... Um, to just say that by default, mm -hmm. if we're at, if we come to a certain juncture that, you know, if we both seem logical, that by default, because you're the male, you know, you're going to make the decision. Mm -hmm. I, I, I find that ridiculous okay. Okay. because it, for I, it really is based on reasoning. It's based on logic. It's based on circumstance. But we have two equally valid um positions who is the tiebreaker this is the question that's the, the question but i mean is that is that really real how yes. many times do you have 
two equally mm -hmm. logical points that people are standing on, mm -hmm. right? And then, you, you know, just by, come on, I can't, I can't mm -hmm. give up my power like that, mm -hmm. And I, and I would I would argue and I would I would tell other women not to give up their power like that either. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think that because the Rastafari man has gone through the transatlantic mm -hmm. slave, um, you know, horrific experience, mm -hmm. the Ma'afa, we've got what what gives you that? We're just simply because you were born a male? Um, remember that we are part of the same eye. Mm -hmm. You know? And I, I and I think it comes down to, um, you know, what we were created to do. The man was created to, to be that tip of the spear, to lead the family, um, to go out there and, and to chart the course with the, the wise counsel, the stability. The woman is there to nurture mm -hmm. and to make sure that, you know, the vision can be realized. Even in that same speech, his mind said, there is no task in Africa that we can accomplish without woman that was right. you know, paraphrasing right. Right. and that's how i might see it is that um as a brethren you may have an inspiration and a vision but there is not going to be you're not going to be able to achieve it without the help of, of women um that doesn't necessarily even have to be your, your queen necessarily but women in terms of just helping to make manifest you know what i mean well and and that is how i might you see it and we what, can agree to disagree. And can you yield right. to your elder? <laughs> <laughs> she pull rank on yes, me. She pulling rank on me. You see? So I have to just humble to my, my elder sister. Yes, but this I is am. we're gonna come forward to this. Um oh. we're, we're over our but the, the reasoning is so sweet. Um we're gonna come because this is the question, family. This is where we find ourselves as an immunity, you know, brethren on one side, sister on one side. We have to bring these two together for the benefit of the children. Or, like I said, we can talk the biggest lofty talk if the family unit, the first government, is not intact. It's all for naught. So I give thanks for the eye holding the eye ground mm -hmm. and, and being able to really um, uh, articulate the eye, the eye vision, um, and I would ask the eye if the eye can come forward. Yes, because time. I love to speak yes. about the eye tree. Yes. Ah, before we go, the mm -hmm. eye tree, please. Um, block, block on the eye tree, how people can tap into the eye tree. Okay. Well. So the Empress Men and Ask for Blue Fire mm. Leadership Eye Tree is a three day eye tree, which is held around Empress Men and Earth Strong. Mm -hmm. Um, this year is going to be March 28th um through uh, march 31st and so this is an opportunity for rastafari women of all ages because the youngest we've had is 15 okay. the eldest is 70 to come together to focus on their spirituality their growth their leadership workshops that rastafari women partake in um i present I created a model mm -hmm. called the Empress Men and Ask for Blue Fire Leadership Model, mm -hmm. which is a model that rests on three founding mm -hmm. leadership styles that I, based on my study of Empress Men and Life, have identified. Mm -hmm. One of them is exigency leadership, mm -hmm. which is leadership that she um, employed in situations of emergency. Mm -hmm. Another one is iritical leadership. Mm -hmm. You understand? And then another one is truths and right leadership. Okay. So, you know, within leadership, the study of leadership, there are all different types of leadership, transformational, mm -hmm. facilitative, democratic. Mm -hmm. So I thought as a Rastafari woman, if I examine what I perceive to be the leadership patterns of Empress Menon that I could develop a model. Mm -hmm. So I have the model, it rests on three pillars, but the three pillars, um, they're out offshoots of it, which are 18 tenants. Mm -hmm. So I walk sister through what this type of leadership is. We talk about when you should employ, because you won't employ all three at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Based on circumstances, you'll employ a particular one, so they go through the leadership model. They um, have workshops on economics, workshops on self-care. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to have a ritual mm -hmm. as a part of our life as Rastafari women? Mm -hmm. The leadership retreat 
is, is a time for the Rastafari woman to no longer be an addendum. A lot of times we attend these workshops, uh, Pan-African workshops, and we might be the only Rastafari woman at the conference. Well, no longer do we need to be on the periphery because clearly we have our own ideologies. We have our own additions to the lexicon. Mm -hmm. I'm a Rastas. Rastas mm -hmm. stands for royal. Ethiopian, that's with an A, mm -hmm. Cistron, exemplifying, exemplifying stately strength. Mm -hmm. And I always say where there's a Ross, there's a Rasset. Mm -hmm. Where there's a Ja, there's a Jaes. Mm -hmm. So Rastafari women, during this time, mm -hmm. we're sequestered. We don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Food is bubbled. Um, if we do go anywhere, we rent a van and we travel to wherever mm -hmm. we're going. But it's a very eyeful time. And the synergy that is created is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Sister report going back home and not even being able to regulate themselves for like a full two strong. Mm -hmm. They're riding so high. The yeah. vibration is okay. so high. Mm -hmm. So I really want to be able to, to share that information, um, to share that information with your viewers. Yes. This will be our fifth year. Yes, and we're looking forward to at the most, we've had um, 25 fish strands. Wow. Yeah. yeah, just a beautiful, it is the first of its I've kind. I've seen pictures and it, it looks very royal, you mm -hmm. know, very royal. How can people tap in to, um, I only have a 5% female viewership, I'm okay. going to be very honest. Okay. <laughs> According to YouTube statistics, mm -hmm. but um, a lot of Rastafari sisters do reach out to I and say they love the content. So mm -hmm. how do sisters tap in to the eye? Well, they can reach... I mm -hmm. at um, Lalabella mm -hmm. Institute dot org. Uh, that will be up on the screen. So and you can... Lalabella Institute dot com. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Facebook. Old school. Yes. Yes. Um, up under too. my name. Yes, yes. Jazanai Kush. Mm -hmm. And I'm very personable. You know, ones reach out to I. I respond. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm just. You know. No, and I, I, I can vouch for that. Um, very, you know, no airs, uh, very mm -hmm. down to No earth. pretense. No pretense. Um, so in terms of um, what is the cutoff time? We're filming this in, in late June. What is the mm -hmm. cutoff time for them to register for this year's I treat? We'll be, the flyer will go out July 23rd. Okay. Um, they will have until January. We have payment. Okay, um, nice. you know, offerings. And so all they have to do it if they're interested and they'll love it. First of all, um, many of the sisters who come, I don't know them okay, at all, okay. but the warmth that I and I create, we're renowned for that. You mm -hmm. know, it's just love. You're safe. If you're a king man and you're mm -hmm. thinking, Hey, you say you have a mostly male viewership. Yeah, yeah. Somebody might say, I want my queen to attend that. If you're yeah. not, we took you up from the airport, mm -hmm. you know, you're there with us for the three days. We return you home safely mm -hmm. and you're all the wiser for having attended, you yes, know. Yes, so, um, yeah, January will be the cutoff. So they'll have really from July to January. Which is reasonable. Yes. And the price is reasonable, too. Okay. It's $450. That includes six or six to eight idle organic meals. Mm -hmm. That includes your... Um, your transportation to and fro oftentimes, mm -hmm. but definitely your housing, mm -hmm. okay? Your gift bags, your materials. You can't get a I treat for 450 like that any place, but I no. know it's Rastafari, so we're being economical. And, and that's very powerful. Um, I know several Sistrin who have been multiple times and mm -hmm. they rave about the, the I treat. So it's definitely something that we need. And again, it's about building these institutions mm -hmm within the immunity so that we have these type of outlets um for the next generation because we don't see a lot of young sisters coming right. up in the chat and we really need to exemplify because i find the, the top the culture for young sisters right now is very toxic very sexualized mm -hmm. i have a daughter mm -hmm. um who's, who's 15 so i'm in the, in the heat of it when i'm listening to the music you know, and I know, I, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite because we were listening to all type of music. I told you about Luke earlier. When I was her age, I can't say what we were listening to. But when you're a parent and you're listening to your mm -hmm. children with this low vibration, low frequency music, and then we don't have an alternative, it, it doesn't sit well, you know. So right. I'm glad 
that the AI has been putting this in place in terms of institutions that we can even send, you know, um, young sister to to be around right. with that Rastafari energy. So make sure uh, tap in. We'll have a link in the description as well um, that you can tap in. Um, any final songs um, to the family, uh, to the Lion Pride uh, that the AI just want to share. And this is the first get used to seeing the sister. We're gonna do some more activation. I'm, I'm very blessed to, to, to have this initial reasoning, but this is not the end. This is the beginning. So please, any final song? Well, I just would like to say to the audience, you know, this is the time for the Rastafari man and the Rastafari woman to truly unify. Yes. Um, there should be no divisiveness. However, in order for that to be accomplished, Haile Selassie I talks a lot about the new race mandate, or I and I have deemed it as the mandate, right? The final charge, right? Of, you know, I and I becoming something that I and I education, our experiences have never prepared I and I for. So that's going to take a reframing of gender issues or gender, the way that we view gender, gender roles. Really and truly, it's about the fittest of the fittest. It's about who can stand, who can do what, right? Who's the most effective? And as far as I'm concerned, that's going to be the glue and that's going to be the cohesiveness to, to helping Rastafari catapult itself to be able to meet that final charge of becoming members of the new race. And that's basically what I would say. And I would really like to commend the I again, mm -hmm. the Jazz Match Quasi, for even having these frank conversations. Yes. We're not going to always agree, no. but what's important is that our philosophies and our opinions get out, and your platform is surely doing that. Yes. So, give and that high level that. Rastafari reasoning, because yes. we have these reasons all the time amongst ourselves. Right. But we come from a generation we didn't want to put camera on anything, so right. we don't do ourselves any service in a digital age, keeping all of this to ourselves because right. the other people are airing their philosophies and opinions every day on the internet. Mm. So I don't really see a space where these high level Rastafari reasonings can live. So that's one of the things I want to do with this platform. Cause this is, uh, this is par for the course. We, you know, Rastafari people, we reason like this all the time. Right. It's love on fire. That's how we chat, especially in the night of being Yada. So, this is nothing new, but in terms of it being televised and recorded, we, we, we haven't done that. And I say we've done ourselves a disservice in terms of public relation. May I, may I share the book really quickly? Yes, Just to please, show, please. Yes. because this book in particular, mm -hmm. well, this one, and I'll let the audience see Beautiful. it. Beautiful. And we'll zoom in on it too. Yeah, thanks. This mm -hmm. book particularly um, deals with the ascension of the Ja S in Rastafari mm -hmm. because um, she has to be placed on her rightful throne, mm -hmm. right? Even in the iritical and spiritual realms. Um, however, in accordance with what the Jazz Match Kwasi and I are reasoning mm -hmm. about, this book is a Rastafari um, love story okay. where the characters deal with what it is that we're, we're I and I are reasoning okay. about, um, what it means to um, come together to be able to make the decisions that are necessary in order for two very powerful individuals, Michael Selassie mm -hmm. and Areola, to be able to go forward and, and become members of the new race. So I'm, I'm talking I'm about it and I'm writing about it. And too. I'm glad because you're doing fiction too. I'm writing a fiction book right yes. now. And I think we as Rastafari also have to get into this fiction mm -hmm. um, side of things, film production. My vision with this platform is to create a multimedia platform where we're creating all types of content. You know, I look at Walt Disney, what they're doing. They're pushing their agenda. Mm -hmm. Where's our yeah. you know, company that we're doing all these forms of family entertainment? You know, I look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the this, the that, all of these things that captivate. And I'm saying we have so many African stories. We have mm -hmm. so many traditions, yes. mythology that we could be using to educate the youth or to spark that curiosity for people to go and research. So exactly. give thanks yes. um, for doing the work, not just having the reasoning. Um, and this is so important. Um, why? Because the time has come for the lions 
to tell our own story. And this is The Lion's Voice. Yeah. And it's last said the first of the Almighty. Well, there are set thrones of judgment to judgment. Thrones of the house of the great King David. I and I shall pray for the peace of Ethiopia and Africa. Yeah. Every night, argument, morning come. So we both are argument. No make your heart get hard like some sweat cement. Black woman, got to exercise patience. Every night, argument, morning come. So we both are argument. No make your heart get hard like some sweat cement. Black man. Got to exercise patience Got to change the frequency Seems like we disagree frequently Mama shopping spree interfere with school fee Daddy they a dance of philosophy and it say Every night them fight mostly over money Who gonna stand up fight for the family? I listen, I see, my of the trinity Come with this queen with a baby in her belly still Every night, da, 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 argument, morning come So we both are hard you went Now make your heart get hard like some sweat cement Black woman, got to exercise patience Every night, da, 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 argument, morning come so we both are hard you went No make your heart dead Hard like some sweet cement Black man Got to exercise patience There's no need to raise your voice Let's live in a one harmony Together we can make that choice To live as one family And please don't disturb the children's sleep Be careful what you say Remember words cut deep Sometimes it's better if you just sit in silence Time to end this cycle of violence